Hey there. Before we get started, I want to let you know about a way you can help out this show, especially if you plan on following along uh, with these books. Go to duckfeed.tv slash tip jar and use the Amazon links there if you're planning on doing any shopping on Amazon. We're just now approaching the holidays, um, so if you are uh, going to be buying anything there, that is a great way to do it. Uh, it takes you to the same Amazon, and uh, we get a small cut of the proceeds of whatever you buy. It's like a little affiliate program uh, kind of deal. Um, this is especially great if you're going to buy uh, The Gunslinger or any of the other books we're going to uh, speak about. Uh, and that is duckfeed.tv slash tipjar. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Cole Ross, and welcome to Radio Free Midworld, a podcast book club about the Dark Tower series of books uh, here with the second chapter of uh, The Gunslinger, the first book in the series, our first non-pilot episode that we've done. Um, and I'm so happy to be joined today by Autumn Greer. Autumn. Hello. Um, by uh, Patty Smith. Hey, Patty. Hello. Good evening. Yeah. Is it okay to use your last name? Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> All right. Um, and then also by Chase Greenlee. Hi, Chase. Hey, Cole. Yeah. And hello, Hello, Duckfeed folk. Hello, everybody. Everybody who's joining. <laughs> yeah. So um, very happy to have this uh, the, the, this assembled group here of people uh, um, either from other shows like like Patty is from uh, from Twin Humanities or uh, even from the community like uh, like, like Autumn uh, is and, uh, and and Chase as well um, here to talk about this. So I kind of want to take a uh, a bit of a page from uh, from Bonfire Side Chat before we get started with the Waystation uh, uh, section here, and kind of uh, ask people their 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 histories with the uh, with 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 the, with the series. Patty, I'm curious um, how you kind of came to these books. Okay, um, so I'm I'm probably the baby of this show, uh, like Murph was the baby of the last show. Uh, I actually picked up these books on a whim uh, about. About a year ago, uh, they came into my work. I work in a charity shop, and the whole set came in. And I was like, ooh, oh, I've always wanted to read those. <laughs> yeah, sure, why not? How much do you want? Bend me over, take my money. Uh, so they extorted me for quite a large amount of money. Uh, and I bought them home. And it took me a few months before I even started to read them. Uh, I think I only actually started about four or five months ago. Like, it, it was this year. It was, like, summer. Yeah. Um, and I've currently made it. I finished... Uh, Wizard and Glass about two weeks ago. Okay. Um, so I'm not all the way through yet. Um, so I'm still kind of forming ideas about how things are working. And I, I understand that I'm at the midpoint, sort of. And it's kind of the next three books are kind of almost the second half of the story from what I understand. Yes. Um, Wizard and Glass is definitely a turning point. Yeah. So I'm I'm on the cusp of hitting the halfway mark. Uh, so I'm very excited. Nice. Um, Autumn, when, uh, when, when you found out that Jeremy was on the, uh, the, the, the previous episode, you expressed interest in hopping on right away. You, uh, you've liked these books for a while, haven't you? Um, absolutely. But I, I do have to say, I, I was a kind of a late comer, I guess, in my Stephen King reading career. I had read pretty much everything that Stephen King had written, but I put off reading The Gunslinger for years. Uh, to me, I just assumed that it was going to be a Western and um, Westerns kind of aren't my scene. Like when they're doing my epitaph, they're never going to put like Autumn Greer. She loved Westerns, you know, like that's just not... <laughs> <laughs> that's well, not me yeah, I mean, it flows so nicely though <laughs> <laughs> so i had just assumed that that's what it was because you know when you read the blurb on the back in the bookstore back when we all still went to bookstores you are like you know like oh it's it's such a genre shift it's such a change from stephen king's usual stuff so finally probably my freshman year of college i went ahead and read it and very quickly you know, I went from, man, a Western to um, all things serve the beam, bro. You know, like I <laughs> yeah. was into it. Um, luckily, luckily um, I was able to jump right into reading the next three books. Um, you know, they were right there for me to pick up and go with. But um, yeah, that, that's how I got into it. Um, unwilling and then um, very, very, very willing. Uh, at roughly what <laughs> point did, uh, did, did, the, did you sense that it wasn't going to be like a straightforward Western? Um, I think, uh, you know, like you're going through, you're going through, you know, we talked about the first one, you're going through tall, you're going through that. And I'm like, okay, yeah, there's a guy, he has a gun, he has a quest. You know, I mean, obviously the opening is good. The, um, turns of phrase that he comes up with are perfect, but, um, 
I don't know, as soon as we get to this chapter, that's one of the reasons I wanted to be on this one, the way station, you start to realize once you meet Jake, as we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, it, it is not um, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It is not the Magnificent Seven. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh. So I, I I like hearing that. I, I I'm a person who enjoys a, who enjoys a good western, and I was pleasantly surprised when this when this did take a turn, and I noticed the the shift right away. Here's a, here's a delayed huh. joke. Would you say, Autumn, that your tombstone would never be a DVD copy of Tombstone? Oh, nice! Man, I thought you'd go are. for a good Louis Lamore mm, joke, no? but man, you just went there with the tombstone. Well played. Yeah, no, about five <laughs> minutes too late, but I I I, I can't squander that. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and Chase, how about, how about you? When, uh, when, when did you come to these books? Well, actually I'm, uh, I'm going to have to usurp Patty for being the baby of the group because <laughs> oh, no. uh, I, yeah, no, it's me. It's been me the whole time. Um, I picked it up last year actually after, um, it came up on bonfire side chats after like on like three or four different episodes. I feel like it <laughs> came up one right after the other. And I worked within a walking distance of a bookstore. So I just walked over and picked it up and I uh, blazed through the first book. And I was like, this is great. And then I just never went back to it again <laughs> until uh, recently. So I am I actually just finished reading The Way Station this morning. OK, uh, so I'm I'm pretty fresh on this part. But um, my context for the rest of it is still kind of foggy. Nice. Well, th this is kind of a goal of the show, too, is to kind of blend blend and merge these different perspectives, because mm -hmm. uh, as Autumn, as you can attest, like reading this series again with knowledge of what happens kind of casts a different light on a bunch of this stuff. So having that fresh perspective is actually going to be something that's really valuable. Yeah. Um, so uh, also kind of related to that, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the spoiler policy. Some people uh, asked for clarification of that after the pilot when we inadvertently spoiled something related to the stand. Sorry, guys. Um, uh, just to kind of outline it, uh, we're going to try our very best to kind of keep um, references oblique. Um, especially if they if they concern things that are far ahead in the series or uh, reveal information about things that happen in related books, you know we're going to get to those. We're going to mention them uh, at the time that they that they come up. But um, consider it almost like bonfire side chat rules, where um, if we do mention something from far far afield in the future, it is not going to be by name. Um, we're probably just going to make a, make a slight reference to, and then be, be on consider yourself safe to read along with this at the uh, glacial pace that we have set. We want to make sure everybody can kind of use this as a companion, um, to, uh, to help enhance their enjoyment of the series. Does that sound good? Fantastic. Yeah. So cool. um, all Super these detailed fair. notes that I have about book seven, I guess I'm just going to crumple them up right here. Just <laughs> shut it down. <laughs> so much excellent Foley work. We had that in the uh, in, in the in the green room and now we've got it here. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so last time we talked about chapter one, uh, season one here is going to be kind of chapter by chapter. That's going to change when we get to uh, the drawing of the three and beyond, uh, just because the structure of the books gets a little bit more wonky. However, Gunslinger has these nice little subdivided chapters, which are uh, really good. Uh, but we found out we, we we were introduced to the Gunslinger and we heard about uh, his encounter with Brown, the farmer, and his uh, talking, farting Raven Zoltan. Um, and we also heard about the uh, uh, the showdown in the town of Tull, um, where the man in black kind of left this trap um, for him in the in the form of this resurrected corpse. And now the entire the entire village is nothing but corpses. But now we are going into the Mohane Desert in pursuit of the man in black. And Roland is not in a good way. Like, so this is the way station. This is kind of all about uh, this uh, this way station and what Roland finds there as he is kind of out of water and completely delirious. And he comes up. Um, so we should talk about Jake Chambers because our introduction to him is pretty striking because Roland actually thinks that he's the man in black. Like he, he he takes a look at him and says, like, oh, he's he's wasted away to nothing and the sun has bleached his hair white. That kind of just shows you how Roland's kind of doing the thing he didn't want to do, which is sort of losing his mind a bit. He's <laughs> yeah. out of water. He's staggering. Mm -hmm. He's knackered. Mm -hmm. um, and he's like, oh, it's a, a shape. That's probably him. It's different. Height. <laughs> his hair's different. Uh, it's female. <laughs> it's, it's gained 40 pounds, but it's him. <laughs> also single-minded obsession which is kind of his jam 
<laughs> I really liked it in there when he's talking about how he, you know, he falls and he like scrapes his hands and he describes his blood as smug. And I don't think that there's a time that I've fallen down and started bleeding that I haven't thought my blood looks smug. So that really resonated with me. Yeah. Like, really, really blood? Oh, fine. You know? <laughs> you think now's the time? You think now's the time that this is going to happen? <laughs> he seems really bitchy when it kind of the ground soaks it up. Like, <laughs> yeah, fuck you, blood. <laughs> yeah. Come away from me. You're not the star of this Get story. <laughs> yeah. Um, another great thing, uh, just uh, while we're on the uh, the cool turns of phrase, the description of the way station itself, kind of the stable and the uh, and the in building. I love this line where he t- talks about his appearance, saying like, "Oh, it was it was wood being transmogrified into sand, mm. like it was undergoing this weird petrification process by being blasted uh, through the elements." You know, really uh, kind of goes to show how long it had just probably sat there undisturbed until the events we're about to see. Yeah. <laughs> And so um, we're introduced to, uh, to 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 Jake, who is kind of this archetypical, um, you know, plucky little kid um, when he uh, when he comes up, kind of like one of his defining lines is, oh, you know, I don't I don't like people. They fuck me up like this is a profoundly disaffected young man. <laughs> <laughs> but Roland doesn't you have know- the best introduction either. He kind of. Look, he's this cool gunslinger, but his first attack is to run forward going, I can see you. I'm going to shoot you now. <laughs> yeah, it t- doesn't seem very in character. He attempts it? to jump over the fence and uh, and he uh, and, and he trips over it. Hmm. You know, mm. I always thought that Jake seemed like Roland's little mother in this because, you know, they mm-hmm. start off with Roland with a little rhyme in his head with his mom caring for him as a boy. And then he passes out at Jake's feet and kind of comes to and Jake's giving him water. You know, Jake's really <laughs> caring for him. So it's like a like a little little blonde nine year old mother, you know, <laughs> mother Jake. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's a that, that's a thing throughout the entire series, like with a couple of exceptions, like Jake being 11 kind of doesn't matter. Like he is incredibly mature for, 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 Mm. you know, probably because he, you know, ends up dying about six or seven times. Um, that's not spoilers. Like it'll, it'll (laughs) good. Actually, one thing when, you know, you guys had talked a little bit in the previous episode about Stephen King going in and doing some revisions. One of the revisions that he did in this chapter that kind of stuck out for me and, um, you know, I don't usually talk about scatological stuff on podcasts, but that mm-hmm. interlude where Jake mentions, well, it's been three poops, sir, since I, <laughs> y- 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 you know, like that's how oh. I reckon time. It's really hard for me since he added that passage back in to reconcile that with the kind of kid that would say, I don't like people. They fuck me up <laughs> to like, like a little Oliver twist. Like it's been three poops, sir. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, look, you mark the time like you mark the time. Yeah, I've got, the, I've got no clocks, sir. <laughs> Please, could you spare me a watch? <laughs> yeah, um, you could probably like mark the wall, you know, like a like a prisoner. Oh, the poop. Oh, oh no! <laughs> oh. oh, we're taking a hard left turn. <laughs> just leave it in lines on the floor. <laughs> How long have I been? But I, I just seven. <laughs> I thought that was a weird thing to go back and add because again, I'm sure one of the complaints was, you know, maybe Stephen King was a younger guy when he wrote this. He didn't actually have an 11 year old boy of mm-hmm. his own. You know, he probably went back in and had to age it down a little bit. But yeah, yeah I thought that, that that really stuck out for me because it's, it really is an odd way to measure time. It, 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 it certainly is. And I think that it like plays into the desperation of this. I, I it, it felt so this is going to sound weird. It felt so natural um, in, in in there. Like it doesn't seem like something that would have come through on a second draft. If anything, it seems like something that would uh, that would kind of be cut out because when Stephen King was doing this, he was kind of going back in with knowledge of the later characterization. In fact, so much of the, uh, of the revision was to like bring this in line with the later books. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, but you're right. I had that line highlighted too, but I was like, there's no way we're actually going to talk about this on the show. Right. Um, and we totally, God, did... you know that that's the only thing I had written on my paper. It was just that one thing. <laughs> yeah. I've got 20 minutes worth of notes about yeah. that line. <laughs> yeah. It was, it, it was just one post-it that said three poops. Um, <laughs> Jake has a case of amnesia. He not only does not know how to mark time aside from his body functions, uh, he, he does not know where he came from or how he got here. Um, he has a couple of these kind of flashes of maybe a couple of different details, but it seems like the longer he, he he's here, the more he, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the more his old life is kind of slipping away from him, but he's very clearly kind of talking about, uh, New York. When he when he's he mentioning this, Zorro doesn't he as well? Yep, 
Yes. Which is one of those, another one of those kind of, hey, wait, what? <laughs> like the Hey Jude from the last chapter, like, wait, yep. Zorro? Mm -hmm. Hang on. <laughs> that, 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 that doesn't fit. Yeah. Um, I, I love the line here. Uh, I, I know it sounds crazy, but the statues sold the clothes. <laughs> when he when he's talking about the uh the big buildings with uh with the windows on uh out front uh mm -hmm. the, the thing, things like that talking about mrs shaw who's uh his housekeeper and then also talking about bama uh which is his nickname because i think it's either mrs shaw autumn uh, correct me if i'm wrong is it mrs shaw or his dad who's the crimson tide fan oh you know i'm actually gonna have to think back on that i'm not positive yeah uh, so i want to say it's mrs shaw yeah, I uh, just so here's the thing in the time since this show got funded, I've listened to the entire series on audiobook. And that was a month ago as of the time we record this 150 hours of audio. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I just I remember I remember something casting back, but they call it, you know, they, Mr. Shaw calls him Bama in, in secret is uh, is the thing nobody can know about the secret nickname uh, that they yeah. have. Um, so let's talk about Jake's death. Like, how did this, how did this strike you guys specifically like Patty, Patty and Chase, like the, like the description of this actually going, going to New York like this? It was definitely a, it, I would say it was jarring if the Zorro and Hey Jude hadn't come up first, uh, having those already in there, um, in the previous chapter and this one definitely kind of set the stage for something to be like, all right, we are we are neighboring worlds. And I think they even say something about the next world over in the previous chapter. Yeah. Um, and uh, having that there definitely, you know, it wasn't a huge, like, Oh, what the fuck? But <laughs> um, it was uh, kind of nice to have that confirmed. It's like, okay, this is, this is the vocabulary we're working with right now. Yeah. Um, and particularly the death itself. Like, I mean, it set up a very, very, bleak existence for this wealthy child in new york city uh but the death was incredibly gruesomely written and i wasn't uh really expecting that to come at me uh, as hard as it did yeah it's um the, 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 there's one little detail about that uh jake says when the blood came out of my mouth i could taste my own shit and that was the line i was thinking about yeah yeah Yo. it's <laughs> Um, again, that, that kind of cuts to the quick in a, in a real severe way. How about you, Patty? Like this, this kind of shift to kind of our, our own context here. Yeah, I, I have to agree. Like without those kind of Zorro and Hey Jude links before this, I'd have been going, um, what, what's <laughs> happening here? But the fact that we've got that little, just little lead in, you've got just a little, just a little breadcrumb to grab onto and just, just to follow along. Yeah. Um, I liked it. It was kind of very quickly established, like who Jake was in the previous world, how his parents kind of. They had him, but they didn't really <laughs> care about him much. Right. Um, his dad's a, a cokehead, crazy TV guy. Yeah. Um, and oh, he no, sorry, he drinks. He has Coca Cola. Sorry, it's Coca Cola, isn't it? You have to put a Coca Cola. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's a, 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 a little toot of daddy's secret powder. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it, it's kind of like it's very quick, but it kind of brings it all together like really quickly. Like it sort of strikes Jake as um, a very professional child who <laughs> talks to people quite openly and scares them off by being very professional, I think was the line. <laughs> Something like that anyway. Yeah. Uh, all the girls kind of get scared off by him because he's so kind of cool and calm and professional with them, which was weird, but I enjoyed that line. <laughs> Yeah, um, his his parents do not hate him, but they seem to have overlooked him. Is uh, is is the line mm. that that re that that that, re that really hit me. And then also uh, this idea, like, oh, he doesn't hate himself yet, but given time, you know, it <laughs> it, it, it probably it probably will. Mm. Like, uh, bleak is exactly the right word for it. Like, Jake is, uh, you know, for 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 as much privilege as he, as he has, you know, being the son of a of a network TV guy who's a master of the kill. Um, it's, it's, it's not painted in a good way. Um, it should be noted that, uh, um, in the recollection here. So, uh, Jake is being hypnotized by Roland. Um, th this is kind of Roland's little trick and he does this a lot where he will take a bullet shell, uh, which I don't know, for some reason, I think that that sounds dangerous, uh, even though that's crazy. Um, and he will like make it dance on the back of his hand in order to like make people, you know, go to sleep, hypnotize them, make them compliant. <laughs> and so, you know, Jake is kind of like presenting this when he, when he's under and he has kind of perfect recall when he's in this, but he describes, oh, the man in black, this, the, this priest, um, who kind of came up and pushed him out. You know, tracking back to that bullet for a second, I've always wondered when I read this, you know, we show up at the way station, we've got that atomic slug that's dying. 
Um, we've got society that's decaying. I've always wondered if um, magic is dying and it's on its way out too, because Roland's so casual about that and he doesn't seem to think that it's a big deal. But that's probably the most magical thing, one of the more magical things that we see him do during the series. I wonder if that's kind of sometimes all that he had left um, from whatever the golden age of Gilead was, if those gunslingers were actually trained in something uh, a little bit more magical than just the laws of the land and shooting a gun really well. Um, because again, he's really casual about it. Like, Oh yeah, just do this bullet thing. No big deal. But I mean, the reader is kind of like, Hey, wow, you can do magic. Nice. You, you know, yeah. but I, I, I wonder puts, if it, magic is decaying too. It puts his reloading trick from the last chapter in a whole new light. Maybe he puts the gun inside his hat and it comes out and there's bullets in it. Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> he just uses the power of suggestion. He hypnotizes the bullets to jump into the gun themselves. <laughs> Watch me as I turn this rabbit into a full new case of bullets. <laughs> but where's the rabbit go? He goes into the bad guys, honey. Um... <laughs> that, that, that's the trick. You can do any magic that you want as long as it's making bullets. <laughs> right. Oh, no. Bullet and bullet adjacent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh but uh but yeah so like you have these two kind of like magic men going through and like so talking about the gunslingers being practitioners of this of of, of this kind of art you know they were trained like i don't know if we learn a lot about van a here um in this book i think van a comes later but like you know gilead is a magical place and like they're educated in you know especially like as the cosmology of the series gets kind of like uh bored out like every gunslinger has to know like what the prim is and things like that like they're very very well learned because they essentially have to be like diplomats too yeah hmm. um <laughs> so looking at this here so we, we we bring jake back and he uh you know roland asked him hey do you want to remember any of this do you, do you want to remember what your dying shit tasted like um <laughs> no no please no sir <laughs> How will I know what time it is if I always taste the, the but <laughs> remember that time my spine got crushed and my and my genitals got destroyed? Yeah, let's remember that. Yeah, oh yeah. I uh, forgot about Can't the genitals. Remember much. Let's I mean, remember that. <laughs> for what it was worth, he wasn't really thinking about that at the time. He was really worried about like dying before he got his bowling score up to where it needed to be. That is the most seventies thing. I read this bit wrong. I thought he said before he got his score over seventy two. I was thinking <laughs> that's a really specific <laughs> score to try and beat. <laughs> Yeah, it was, so a little kid being especially concerned about his bullying feels like the most 70s thing imaginable. Um, and, you know, this is in 1977, but, like, I, I don't know, that, that that is a particular time and place, you know. I, th I think that, like, and any bowling alley does seem like it, it is from the 70s because it's never been touched and nobody's been in one since then. But, um yeah. So uh, mo moving on here. So there's a little bit more. Uh, Autumn, you talked about the, uh, the, the the pump with the uh, with the atomic slug, right? Um, and obviously yes. in the first version of this book, North Central Positronic uh, was, wasn't a, was not a thing, right? No. OK. Yeah, there, there's actually it's available online. You can go look. Um, someone has gone through and looked at every single um, change and. For the most part, I mean, when you skim through them, um, they really do help with continuity. Uh, I was a little bit put off by them at first, but I, I completely get why he did some of these things and having it tied in a little bit better just because, I mean, anytime you're writing something over 30 years, you're going to have <laughs> a little bit of the continuity trouble, you know? Yeah. Um, in some of the, uh, the, the, the later books, um, at least in the, in the uh, prologues to them, uh, Stephen King like, specifically thanks like Robin Firth, like the person who, who wrote the, uh, the concordances actually um those are actually interesting reads too in a way that probably um nobody who is not crazy about these series would <laughs> would understand maybe but um actually reading those concordances that which are just these alphabetical listings almost like uh um an encyclopedia like if you want to know who hacks is you can learn everything about hacks because mm -hmm. it is like a bi like a biography and it's cited it tells you page numbers and stuff like that um, yeah. they're, they're very interesting that, that list actually autumn that you, uh, that you mentioned, I think, uh, it was, uh, it was Zach from video games, hot dog who shared that with me, um, way back after this, uh, the, the, the pilot came out, um, mentioning that list to me. So I'm going to find a way to put that in the show notes because that is actually really useful for somebody who wants to like hunt down and find those, uh, and find those. Um, uh, additionally, you, Autumn, you shared the, uh, the, 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 the original postscript, right? Um, with me, you sent along yes. an email. What's in that? 
um, in the first episode, you guys were talking about the, the the special paper, the special colored paper that you know they ended up splitting a few different ways, and that's what turned into the first version of um, the book. Um, and again, he's not saying that it's actual magic paper, but um, <laughs> with an odd coincidence, he and a couple of his other author friends all went on to be successful writers, and they all happened to write a book on this special colored paper. Uh, but it's just kind of a, I guess, interesting anecdote, you know? Yeah. yeah I'll, I'll make sure to, uh, to, to, to put that in there as well. Um, and any, anytime. So if you're listening to this and you find resources that are like that, um, please send those along because I want to, uh, I, I want to kind of do this right. <laughs> and again, this is a series that was written over the course of 40 years. Um, more if you count the, uh, the eighth book, but, um, but yeah, uh, the, the, those resources are all really cool. Um, so moving on to the speaking demon and kind of this, uh, this water pump, uh, North central positronics, uh, like most of the things that were added in with the revision are actually that that's important, but it's not going to play in for another four or five books. So just, uh, mark that one off, I suppose. <laughs> the thing uh, with that sort of stuff is that you just forget it because yep. I've, I've reread these first two chapters over the last couple of days. Um, and, and given the point I'm at in the books where I'm just finished wizard and glass, like a lot of the references and going, oh, that means that. Oh, that was that. I'd forgotten all yeah. about this stuff by the time I got there. It yeah. was just a name in a book. It was, oh, we're going to go to the Flagle Mountains later. Cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you get that, hmm, Flagle Mountains. wonder what this deal is. Mm. Is that where the Flagles live? <laughs> yeah, you'd think that. <laughs> and for Fair and Flagle. Yeah, it's like, a, it's like an Iceland Green, Greenland thing. They named it that specifically because there were no Flagles. Yeah, the Flagles actually have moved on. <laughs> 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 so sorry. <laughs> That's perfectly fine. <laughs> so even if the magic hasn't moved on from this place, uh, has moved on from this place rather, uh, the, the 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 demons they haven't, and so this uh, this kind of next portion here kind of relates to what's going on in the basement of this uh, of, of this way station. This kind of speaking demon, which you know, Roland treats as just like a regular old thing. Um, and Jake is, you know, scared shitless of, but when they're grabbing some, uh, some canned goods, they, they decide, uh, yeah, something's going on here and we get a little bit of, uh, a, a little bit of exposition. I was really relieved that they didn't take the time to go into any more detail about the, the, the mutie spiders that lived in there. Like he was just kind of casually like, yeah, they might have like 16 legs, eyes on stalks, whatever. We've got more important stuff to talk about, which was actually a relief for me. Yeah. Are, are are spiders a, a no no thing for you? Um, that's also not going to be on my tombstone. Um, the <laughs> Autumn Greer, she loved westerns and spiders, is definitely not not, not going to be my epitaph. So, so the 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 network Christmas card that I'm going to be sending out that is nothing but a, a a spider with a with a cowboy hat that is not going to fly. <laughs> also, the spider flies. Um, Fantastic. Cool. <laughs> I'm glad, 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 glad those Patreon bucks are just going to, to good work. <laughs> yep. Sp- spider media. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this thing, it just kind of like lives in a crack in the wall and uh, speaks in the voices of of uh, anybody, you know, uh, people people from your uh, from your past. This one is speaking in the voice of Alice, the uh, the woman from the inn, um, and saying two very specific things: to go slow past the drawers, and uh, um, when you travel with the boy. The man in black travels with your soul in his pocket. And then there is a magical jawbone that is handed over. Which is quite like Zelda, almost. Here's a jawbone. <laughs> cool. Well, I mean, he, does have to, he does have to punch his way through the wall to get at the jawbone. It's not so much handed over as it is, I'm taking this. <laughs> okay. This yeah. is mine now. <laughs> I want this. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but again, Roland we're, gets a souvenir. He <laughs> claims a relic. Yeah. <laughs> but again, we're we're kind of zigzagging. Like this is this is uh, objectively like a fantasy element that we're that that, that we're getting in this. And there's uh, another fantasy hook here too. Uh, J- J- Jake and Roland are talking and uh, about the Man in Black, talking about Martin slash the Man in Black, and um, Jake is having a lot of trouble sleeping after they've kind of moved on, and they realize, oh, there is a there's a Merlin in both worlds, and also an Arthur. Too. So again, these these worlds that are next door to each other, we're getting a sense of kind of this, you know, the things that are shared and the things that are kind of alien. Mm-hmm. And actually, that's something I think we uh, might have skipped over when we were talking about the uh, flashback into uh, what is probably essentially our world. Um, the Man of Black was there. Yes. Yeah. 
Uh, the man in black uh, was the one who pushed Jake into the street and then ran over as a priest to give him what was the exact wording of it? It was it was something from this world, but I don't remember what it was. It was the last condolences. It was it was something like that. I've got the uh, I've got the book open in front of me here um, as um, it goes. I just remember that it was um, uh, uh, another same turn of phrase that they use later on coming up here towards yeah. the end. Oh, here I've got it. Uh, Go ahead. I'm a priest. Let me through an act of contrition, yeah. act of contrition, uh, which is uh, something that they bring up later on. Uh, and the man in black definitely did come through here. Jake saw him through the window um, three poops ago. As it was. <laughs> yes. Um, Roland asked him, you know, were you scared? Why were you scared? And Jake says, I'm scared of everything. I don't think you I don't think you appreciate the gravity of what's going on here. <laughs> I'm 11. <laughs> how, how many poops is 11? <laughs> Enough. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but yeah, like the, the, the man in black has, has again is leaving these traps for Roland. Um, and this one is a real, is a real son of a bitch because like it's around this time with like with the speaking demon that Roland kind of realizes, ah, oh, shit, I'm falling in love with this kid. The interesting thing for me on Roland is uh, he's kind of a, you know, we, we see him, he comes out, he's a gunslinger, he's this archetype. Um, it seems like heroes are kind of in decay as well because he's like, man, I'm falling in love with this kid. I mean, pretty much in everything else, the hero, the protagonist, of course you're expecting him to take this kid along with him. Of course you're expecting him to, you know, be there to protect the weak and the the vulnerable and that type of thing. It it just seems like Roland's in a state of decay as well. Yeah, it's just kind of like this is this is going to be inconvenient in a lot of ways. <laughs> you know just kind of because this is somebody who you know kind of the story of the series in a lot of ways you know or at least a part of it is Roland kind of learning to open up his heart when he is kind of like getting this you know his companions together getting his uh his cotat and so you know this is again a very cruel prank that uh the, that the man in black is playing or maybe the man in black just knows that Roland has a soft spot for kids. Like, man, not another kid. I fall in love with them so easily. <laughs> ah, <shit. laughs> so um, now we're going to get our kind of first introduction to a place that the series actually spends a lot of time, um, which is uh, Roland's past. You know, we've we've heard a lot about Gilead that was. Uh, it, it's really hard for me to say Gilead instead of Gilead. In in Ohio, there's a there's a, a city mm -hmm. called Mount Gilead, and we always say it Gilead. So the hard add on that is actually difficult for me to do. I will try not to like fall into like straight up Ohio talk. <laughs> but um, but yeah, you, you know, talking about the Man in Black, Roland kind of compares him to to to, to Martin, um, who is the who was the uh, court magician, the 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 counsel for his father, Stephen Deschain um back there and in you know trying to comfort jake and help him go to sleep we learn this horrible story about a man being hung as he is pe pecked apart by birds <laughs> what a lovely bedtime story <laughs> everything's gonna be okay shh, shh. We scatter, it could always be worse we scatter the bread <laughs> it is really fun getting a little peek into how like the gunslinger training actually works one thing when i was um i guess reading this originally like 10 years ago it just made sense to me you know you're used to these sort of origin stories and training montages so it was completely fine in my head i'm like yeah um you know you got punched in the head a few times of course that's that's how you get trained mm -hmm. but now I, I guess maybe in the modern era being a modern reader I guess court does not care about like CTE, like, like, you know, the, the football injury, like with the recurrent concussions. Yeah. Like, I feel like, like maybe he's lucky that Gilead fell because like, there's gotta be some commissioner, like of some like national gunslinger league that would have had a big class action lawsuit <laughs> if they hadn't done that. Like this generation of boys that have been punched in the head so much. They all have like CTE. <laughs> maybe that's why it fell. <laughs> <laughs> it's like court, court, come on. Like we need to have some gunslingers who can like aim a gun, yeah. please. Still, like, like maybe they wouldn't forget the faces of their fathers all the time if you didn't hit them in the head so much. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah, no, he's uh, so Court's always walking around with his braining stick, 
and you know, he's he's basically just a j- just a drill sergeant, right? Mm. I think he he seems very like really harsh. So the first punch uh, is because Roland's pal Cuthbert let a bird off a little bit too slow, and he cold cocks him <laughs> for a tiny tiny thing. Imagine if he didn't let the bird go at all. Does he cut the leg? <laughs> <laughs> oh, the school's hard, man. Yeah, just or just a, a really bad. Well, I'm, we, we know this from later. There, it, there, there's a terrible retention rate, and bad things happen to the people who uh, bad things happen to the people who do not cut it. Mm. Yeah, it's um, it's really rough. And again, this gives us some context on how how Roland became uh, the, the 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 person that he is. Uh, a detail that I love about this, and I will always enjoy uh, uh, I always enjoy this when it pops up in any kind of entertainment. But uh, falconry is a, a major part of their uh, of their training. Falconry is so cool. <laughs> yep. But it's like, hey, the hawk is is God's gunslinger. So you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna learn how to fucking control a hawk. Well, yeah, but they've got this falcon, but its name was David, and that just made me laugh, and I couldn't take it seriously. Hi. This is my deadly bird of prey, Dave. Hey, hey, hi, Dave. Come on! <laughs> uh, one of the biggest regrets of my life, I actually used to, uh, I worked at a uh, YMCA in the middle of the Catskill Mountains, and they had a uh, a raptor rehabilitation program going on there, and uh, a lot of our instructors there had... Uh, experience in actually handling these birds and being able to, you know, have them fly very short circuits around. I mean, still leashed, but Mm -hmm. they did it. And I probably was like maybe three conversations away from being able to be like, you know, not a falconer, but having a bird sit on my hand and go do some shit that I wanted it to do. (laughs) And I just never like it it just never came up in, in a conversation. And I I'm going to regret that for a long time. Yeah. So you, so you were just like, like one, one favor asked away from controlling a bird. Exactly. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, took took a lot of bird pictures though. That was cool. (laughs) When we were introducing ourselves at the beginning, how did you not open with that? That is amazing. Uh, Yeah. I mean, (laughs) you know, know, I'm I'm just a regular guy who can almost control Hawks. No big deal. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> could have almost controlled uh, but yeah no i suppose i did bury the lead on that one my bad <laughs> but um so we're not only introduced to uh to uh david here we're also introduced to uh to cuthbert or Cuth- cuthbert depending on how you pronounce it who is um roland's smart ass best friend at the at this point man i love cuthbert he he's one of my favorite characters in the series he's pretty good yeah um, you, you get more of him in book four, but uh, even kind of even throughout this, we we, we get a sense that he is a uh, he is a solid bro. Um, but kind of the, the both of them, they they fuck up so bad. <laughs> so not only do they have multiple head traumas, they're also ordered to uh, to go to bed hungry. But they've got a buddy in the kitchen who will give them the uh, give them the hookup, you know, give them the sweets who will indulge them. And this is this is Hacks, the uh, the, the the royal the royal cook. Um, and Hax has some secrets. Well, but, I mean, firstly, that's like Hax. That's an interesting name. <laughs> <laughs> Where, like, is that short for something that I'm not getting? Like, I'm I'm not very up with American names. Like, is that short for Harold in America? Or am I have I missed <laughs> yeah. something? It, 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 it's Has. H A Z is a short for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everybody's favorite president was Has Truman. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's just a generic fantasy kind of name. It's a little bit on the nose for somebody whose job probably involves a lot of a lot of chopping and cleaving to to name to name him hacks. <laughs> also on the nose for secret, a little on the nose for secret bad guy. <laughs> True. There's an X in it. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> everybody everybody knows that X is the most treacherous letter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I like that they introduce him as like kindly. Like they go to him for for food, and he's like, "Yeah, have some food. It's cool." And he seems to like all the children. Yeah, uh, and which he, just kind of makes a more of a sting when the bad thing happens. Yeah, well, I I, I like Hax's characterization because like he's he's kind of a, he's a big doofus, and his his good heart and his good intentions are kind of being being used against him because you know we're introduced to this idea of this kind of sectarian fight that is uh, being had between 
Gilead and the affiliation, um, and this guy, John Farson, uh, the, the, the good man, AKA Donald Trump, um, uh who who, who who's kind of this this populist leader we never really get actually it's it's weird we we get like some uh, a picture of uh, of farson in the comics um that uh that kind of take place between um book four and book one uh again that 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 weird chronology where he's kind of more of a more of a bloodthirsty you know kind of like battle general kind of guy um but um in reality in in the books rather you know he's somebody who um you know is like this populist leader who is trying to get people out from under the rule of the gun you know specifically like this this conspirator is saying like all right well we're going to poison all the meat so you know basically the entire the the, the entire castle town dies like they want to you know doma castle gilead um and hack says well i mean that's that sucks. Why would we, why would we do that to the kid? And like, that is used as leverage saying like, Hey, which would you rather see them die now or more kids kind of like suffer under this, you know, autocratic rule or whatever, you know? I'm, I'm trying to, to stick with the no spoiler policy, <laughs> but, um, when that line in there, when, um, and, and you had included in the notes, um, do you see enjoy seeing children under the rule of the gun when they could be under his hands ready to start making a new world? Mm-hmm. I, I wonder if he was looking to get some of these kids to do some some work on the beam or something like that in the future. Oh, just, yeah. just wanted to make a note, note of that. You know, if he was trying to, to work on, you know, uh, just, just, some, just some stuff with the beam that we don't yeah. need to talk about in this episode. But yeah. again, want, want to note it. Uh, I could safely say that as someone who has no idea what you're talking about, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I, someone in the middle, I know what the beam is, but I didn't know you could do stuff to it. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, regardless, it, it's it's a shitty situation. I don't know if they were doing stuff with the beams this early. I don't want to go too much further down this d- d- down this road. Like we don't. I, even... I, I wonder if, if it may be the good man, because we don't know quite as much about the good man sometimes if, he, you know, he was kind of an agent. Um Again, we 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 can we can take a step back. We'll talk about yeah. that in 2019 um, when we're really getting into the weeds and book six and seven, right? Y- yes. Um, I, 20, I, 2022. We'll put a pin in this until 2022. <laughs> right now, with uh, the way things are broken out, uh, we end the series in uh, uh, the, the, we end the show in uh, 2019, which is or we get through the main books in 2019. How about that? Um, did you do that on purpose like, just to do a 19? No, I did not. I, I was <laughs> I, I was working around in a spreadsheet, and no matter how I did it, it kept on ending up in 19. Um, yeah, the, the final <laughs> recording date is September 19th, 2019. <laughs> oh, my God, that's 19 poops away. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Pat, you, you see, see a doctor? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> they're not often but they're impressive <laughs> <laughs> oh god <laughs> um, so this is this is a bad situation um by telling the by, by telling his parents by telling Stephen, who is the, the the din of gilead like you know essentially the the king of this place or at least of the the order of gunslingers by telling him about this you know he condemns um hacks to death uh, a, a great detail in this though is that you know when when Roland goes and tells Stephen, you know, talks to his dad about this, his dad asks, like, hey, why'd you why'd you tell me? And Roland's first answer is, oh, it's treason. And I think it's pretty telling that Stephen's response to that is like, oh, I'd rather you not have told me if you did it for such a stupid, like, textbook reason as that. Yeah, that was kind of cool. Um, but can we just camp out just on, on Stephen Deshane for a minute? That is one of the coolest description introductions I've seen of anything. Just like black jeans, a work shirt, <laughs> a handle mus- bar mustache, and an old knackered coat. Like, I want him to be my dad. <laughs> he's a real cool dad. God, he's so cool. I want to meet that dad. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna go fishing with that dad. The the, the 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 series is kind of is kind of loaded with these kind of additional cotets or group of people who are like I really want to hear about. Like, I would I would hear about Stephen Deshane's travels with with, with his folks. Like. I'm normally down for not down for prequels like that, but I don't know. I, I'm I'm kind of curious what that what that story would have been if they decided to pursue it. Autumn, a, a, a little while back, you it sounded like you were about to say something. Oh, I was about to say the exact same thing. That's all I could think is Stephen is cool. 
Uh, like I, I was trying to do the same thing and track us all back to that because um, I mean, same deal. Like he, he rolls out in his black jeans, which usually I don't think are that cool, but in this case, very cool. Um, I, I think it's interesting too how, um, I guess just kind of casually cruel he is to Roland. Like it reminds me, like in the beginning, you know, when the the hawk when he's um. Uh, hanging out with court and the hawk just rips off a big piece of his arm and then he says you know oh the hawk is god's gunslinger i mean (laughs) steven is just like that hawk like he'll take a strip off a roll and he doesn't care (laughs) he's like you're you're not a smart boy go in the other room (laughs) he straight up says that you're not quick and that will be the the, that that will be your 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 salvation or something like that Mm -hmm. you're not quick but you're formidable (laughs) something there, there there's another line again while while we're taking inventory of these of these things there's a there's a great distinction between b- between Roland and uh, and and Martin or was it the man in black I, I forget but like yeah so so Roland is a dangerous dullard and uh Martin is this incomplete enchanter like i think Steve, like king is doing an amazing job of like finding these little just like phrase nuggets to uh to, to like deploy tactically and, you know, there, there's a lot of bagging on Roland in this first thing for not being a very bright boy, but he seems to deal with the gallows stuff better than anybody else. Um, he seems to be a little bit wiser to to Martin and everything that's going on with Roland's parents. Um, I mean, he's a plotter, but uh, he seems to be getting a more complete picture than a lot of people that are being deceived, you know? Yeah, a lot of people mm. who would, who yeah, who are, who are either being deceived or people who would be uh, kind of reacting more quickly than he was or kind of like jumping to conclusions more quick, more quickly than he does. Yeah. It can seem like there's not a lot going on with Roland a lot of the time. Um, and I think that a lot of that is kind of just that the detail usually goes to his actions as opposed to anything that happens in his, in his interior world. But like the glimpses that we do get are really good. I think a lot of that actually comes through like in showing like, Oh, he's basically, he came out fully formed like this again, (laughs) as this, as this archetype almost. Well, to, to kind of slightly off the same point, something I noticed as I was doing my reread, um, I noticed that in all the flashbacks, he's called Roland. And in all the kind of the main plot, he's called the Gunslinger. They mm-hmm. very, very rarely call him Roland in like the present. I'm doing the quotes with my fingers. The present time bits. They, they exclusively call him Roland in the past and basically call him the Gunslinger for the entire rest of the chapter yeah. when he's not having his flashback. I thought that kind of sets a nice distinction from from boy Roland and an adult Roland. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a really good point. Like he sacrificed his, his humanity or his, I guess, self identity to go on this quest. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's become his job. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they do that quite a bit, actually, like, especially in this book, but like later on, you know, we talked about the, you know, the, the fact that Jake is kind of placed there as a trap almost inadvertently. Roland starts calling him the boy. Um, and sometimes the sacrifice as opposed to even thinking of him, you know, as, you know, John Chambers or Jake Chambers, you know, and that like that, that is something that isn't, that isn't really broken until, until like he kind of becomes a more social creature by, by, by dint of being kind of like accepted, you know, mm. and you get the feeling that like he's been walking by himself for just so long. He kind of can't attach to people anymore. Possibly mm-hmm. he just sort of sees them as bodies. Yeah. <laughs> and in the distance being one shape like that's probably the man in black yep <laughs> <laughs> again that's that that, that single-minded obsession so um he uh you know hacks hacks his, uh he, he has his spot blown up and you know he's he's bound for the gallows um steven sends roland and uh, cuthbert to uh to spread uh bread under the gallows uh for a very specific purpose which is to attract the the, the birds there so that they will be able to eat the body you know, to like, like, like to feed on that. Like, Hey, this, like, this is essentially a dinner bell. He's serving the birds apps. <laughs> <laughs> Breadsticks, sir. Exactly. Some, some loaded potato skin. <laughs> <laughs> can I, can I interest you in some pop- popkin sliders? Um, yeah. Mm, that, that'll come later. <laughs> but um uh they're out there and like Cuthbert has like he he wants none of it essentially they're talking about whether or not they're going to see it you know like everybody it's a little bit like uh like the beginning of game of thrones actually with uh with, with bran like with the kids saying like all right we're mm. gonna have to we're gonna have to watch our dad kill this dude um you know 
again, the, the, these, these formative experiences being kind of inculcated into this, you know, kind of, uh, culture of death almost to get, to, to, to get kind of used to it. And mm -hmm. like, it's very unceremonious, like mm -hmm. Hax is hung without getting a chance to say his, uh, to say his piece. Yeah, I mean, I like well, that they make themselves do it as well. Like, mm -hmm. no one's there mm -hmm. to tell them to go. Like, when they get there early, they go to look at the gallows and, mm -hmm. you know, touch it and see it up close. And they kind of get close and they want to kind of give up. It's like, if Court was here, he'd make us walk up and put a noose on our necks and make us stand there, you know, just to yeah. get us, a, like, acclimatized <laughs> with it. So we're going to do this right now, okay? Yeah, we can't, we can't throw up. We can't pee ourselves. We can't cry. Yeah, it kind of <laughs> gives you a nice idea of, like, the, the sort of the steel or the iron underneath kind of the boys uh you get that occasion with cuthbert when when roland looks at him and sort of sees sees the gunslinger eyes i think mm -hmm. it's another bit of that it's them facing up to you know we're we're, we're cool guys we can do this <laughs> <laughs> we can be tough like dad <laughs> exactly <laughs> I really want a mustache, so I think this is the first step. I want, I want to be as cool as my very cool dad. <laughs> the dad whose face I totally do remember. Speaking of dads, when they go to actually execute Hacks, the 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 guy that was making the pronouncement, Charles, son of Charles, is that the most patronymic thing you've ever heard in your life? Like, like there's people in Iceland who don't reference their dad that much. Like, Charles, son of Charles? Like, yeah, of course you are. You, you know, like... Every time he says it, he just goes, fuck you, dad. I'll do his breath every yeah. time. <laughs> I'm Charles, son of Charles. <laughs> I'm Charles Square. That's my DJ name. Uh, catch me down at the at the community center <laughs> every, 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 every third Thursday of the month. We're going to make this world move <laughs> on. <laughs> And, and, and it'll be at the it'll be at the YMCA. There's like a DJ set, and then everyone gets their hawks out. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> but um, the thing that I I noticed most on the second the the, the second run through um, or third now um, is, uh, is is how they put it that like the crowd has sympathy for hacks. Like this is not a political win. No matter how much you know, this, the, like this was treachery. There, you know, like there, there is treason going on here. They have proof. They have, they have the word of you know the sons of very respected people in, in the country. Like uh, this is, you know, again somebody who was working for a populist cause. You know, somebody that they know who by all by all rights should have been a real solid bro, and they're watching this happen. And again, we get to see a little bit more of this kind of fabric being eroded away. It's interesting to see that Cuthbert str or Cuthbert struggles with it a little bit more than Roland does. Like Roland's, you know, they talk earlier about how Cuthbert um, with his eyes that, you know, and then that moment Roland saw that he, he saw the gunslinger in him, but um, it, you know, he's struggling with it a little bit. And Roland, I think being again, a plotter and uh, a bit of a dumbass, um, <laughs> according to his dad, um, <laughs> it, it, again, is dealing with this very mature situation in a way that other boys his age aren't April t able to, um, which yeah. is something I think that we see a little bit with Jake as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Roland does the thing where he takes a splinter from the gallows and puts it in his pocket. And Cuthbert's like, why? Is it just, just to have it. <laughs> You know, so he's doing, he doesn't know why he's doing it. Like he 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 he's probably grasped something important, but he he hasn't got it yet. <laughs> I would like to see everything that's in Roland's magical mystery bag, like splinters from gallows, a jawbone from a speaking demon. You know, like he's just collecting the whole set in there, huh? Like a yo-yo, yeah. three rabbits, a fully loaded gun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. So everything in the bag can be turned into a bullet. <laughs> that's how they so many of them. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll talk about that that particular scene in the drawing of the three, but we know exactly how many bullets they have. So <laughs> I kind of want to figure out where either where they get more of them or uh, to to actually see if they if they fire. And then obviously there's no way to know because you know they're they're thankfully they're not like R. A. Salvatore asked descriptions of the fights, and then he shot at the shoulder, and then he shot at the head, and it, like. You know, we don't actually have like a shot for shot kind of call on this, but um, yeah, <laughs> I like that, that 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 brief disgusted sound. Yeah, I I just remember reading a lot. Remember reading a lot of our Salvatore in high school, mm -hmm. and the reason you know I liked a lot of it, but the reason I stopped was he just he just couldn't <laughs> get off his own ass about his uh, his fight scenes. Yep, I th I, th I think a lot of people told him that they were good, <laughs> trying to smear <laughs> his feelings. Oh man. <laughs> 
I also uh, noted as we as uh, while I was reading through, he always calls his bag his poke. Um, and it's distinct because it seems like his poke is always like at arm's reach. Um, so I can't help but think it's like it's a kind of like a, a fanny pack. <laughs> and whenever I think of a fanny pack, I think of like the bright neon like pink and yellow ones from my childhood. Oh, yeah. It was like a <laughs> like like a bright colored kind of like nylon Dang one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like for like from the 90s, like it would have a like a Kodak Fun Saver disposable camera inside of it for a field trip. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> got some uh, granola bars in there from when he went to Disneyland a few months ago. They're probably still good. It's fine. It's yeah. fine. Yeah. He's he's got he's got his inhaler. <laughs> <laughs> some small change to make a phone call just in case. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh man at, le- at least they're uh you know so it's something that i have a love-hate relationship with in the series and you don't see an awful lot of it here even with the revisions is um the this like the bespoke words that king invents to be like the vocabulary of of, mm-hmm. of, of, of stuff in the series um later on it's, it ceases to be his poke which is literally just the, another word for bag and it becomes the gunna which is like mm-hmm. the name for your like everyday everyday carry you know, all the knives that you, that you have, and you take a picture of for the internet. Um, yeah. You're you go to your number one gunna. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that story ends with an ominous note, like Gilead would fall five years later. Like it is, oh, it is God, very this much. This sentence is so good. Uh, can you pull it up? Yeah. I've, I wrote it down. Yeah, go for <laughs> Specifically. it. Specifically. Um, uh, back onto our sentence by sentence read. Um, <laughs> The land did not fall to the good man for another five years, and by that time, Roland was a gunslinger, his father was dead, and he himself had become a matricide, and the world had moved on. That's a lot for one <laughs> sentence. There's a lot of things in there. Yep, they're uh, mm-hmm. they're laying out the blueprint. It's like, boom, here's some facts. Remember these. <laughs> oh, okay. Ooh, hello. I... This this. This this escalated quickly. <laughs> I wonder if the matricide line was in there in the initial one. Again, I should probably just do this research ahead of time, as opposed to, as opposed to just uh, supposing on here. No, but... do it now. We'll wait. We'll wait. <laughs> yeah. I don't. I don't have the page open. I can't. I can't take a look. Uh, but that <laughs> is uh, all of that is important that that, that, that you see there. Um, so afterwards, you know, we're getting into something that leads into what happens in the next chapter, but like they're getting into the foothills. There's an awesome line about the, uh, about the bedrock emerging from the, like from the earth, you know, like again, kind of, uh, um, smuggly <laughs> and, uh, you know, we off in the distance because Roland can see from incredible distances, um, you know, they see this figure, um, and we're pretty sure it's the man in black because he is leaping up the sides of mountains um into yeah. this like doing doing cartwheels and tricks like saying haha I mean, it could be a me. goat i mean <laughs> <laughs> it is just a but non-stop the... cirque de soleil with this man in black like he's flipping over <laughs> bodies he's leaping up mountains it really is i can't wait to see uh, matthew mcconaughey do all this <laughs> you should see him make a drink <laughs> i think we, we missed another good line J- just before this back thing um that he remembers one of Court's sayings, you know, the fact that he's catching up with the man in black, which was, wear the man who fakes a limp. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's good. <laughs> this guy's mm. going to fuck with you. And if there was anybody who was going to fake a limp, it is it is this guy. Yeah. It's just like that That says so much about about the man in black almost. It's like, oh, he's, he's slowing down. Oh, you're catching him. You're catching <laughs> him. You're doing a good job. You're not. You're, doing, you're not doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Yeah, uh, they, they 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 see that because like after after Roland joins with Jake, like they're they they're catching up on like his bonfires, like they're fresher and fresher as they uh, as as they get along. Yeah. <laughs> One month old bacon, three week old bacon, <laughs> <laughs> all of which Roland will eat happily and gladly. <laughs> yeah, less um, gladly as it goes on, he prefers it old. <laughs> like oh, this is a week old. This is basically a pig. <laughs> <laughs> Very fun. so that that'll that, that'll finish out this chapter um the the, the way station coming up next we're going to do the uh uh chapter number three which is the uh the oracle and the mountains again these mountains that we see the the, the man in black climbing up uh we're gonna be back in two weeks uh with that thank everybody for uh for, for for listening before i do any any real admin stuff i want to i want to hear where everybody uh can find you folks autumn where can people find you uh you can't <laughs> it's not 
<laughs> you know, I don't really have anything that I'm actively working on or promoting or anything like that. You know, there has to actually be somebody to listen to all of these podcasts and read all of these books. So that's mostly what I concern myself with. <laughs> you're, um, you're a researcher. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, there have to be there have to be consumers, <laughs> consumers of all this bountiful media. But you're on Twitter, right? Like I see uh, I see pictures and stuff. Um, I, I suppose I, I am on like things like Instagram and Facebook or whatever, but I would not say that I have a strong social media presence. So oh. I, I suppose if you want, if you want to find me, um, <laughs> man, that's that's tough. That's tough luck. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'd say your your worst half was the one who has the presence, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, uh, Jeremy did want me to plug some some of his stuff, but I I, I just. Decided not to. I crumpled up that piece of paper too. Yeah, don't 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 give him that for free. Come on, in your face, Jeremy. <laughs> uh, Patty, how about you? Where can people find you? Yeah, um, well, I uh, co-host the Twin Humanities podcast, which is you know that other Dark Souls podcast that's out there. That one. Um, you can find me on Twitter uh, at Paddy Stardust. Um, you can find the podcast on at Twin Humanities. We've got a YouTube channel we do stuff on. Uh, that, that, yeah, that's generally where I live these days. <laughs> um, we we talk about Dark Souls as well as you. Uh, we hate it a bit as well. <laughs> Dark, Dark Souls 3, rather. Um, I'm really glad that I don't do Bonfire Side Chat because I would have given up at this point because yeah. who cares anymore? <laughs> like... Yeah, you know we only have like a like a month left we have we have two episodes and then the dlc which is going to save everything so that's good yeah three um, poops away three poops away <laughs> three poops away. oh no that's gonna make so many people angry <laughs> um and, and chase where can people find you uh you can find me on twitter at t q loudly uh you can find me on youtube at thinking quite loudly on there um i haven't updated that in a little while but there is a healthy chunk of content there and i do have every intention of getting back to it at some point it is you know just a matter of finite hours in the day uh for something that i am updating a little bit more regularly though you can find me at chase g photo on facebook uh that is my photography page i do uh, uh try to post it a little bit more regularly on there uh yeah that's about it Awesome. Well, thank you. Th thank you all for, uh, for, for, for joining us here for this episode. Uh, I'll keep the admin very short. If you would like to help the show, um, in this, in these early days after a show just begins, it's especially important to go and rate and review it on iTunes. Um, if you're coming here from other shows and you're saying, oh, I've already rated such and such other show, it really does make a difference. Um, if a whole bunch of people hit it, uh, right at once, we can get featured on different pages. So I greatly appreciate if you, uh, take just a moment to go and, uh, even just do a star rating, um, whatever you think we deserve. And, um, yeah, that, uh, that, that, that makes a big difference. Additionally, uh, patreon.com slash stuck TV, um, is where you can go to support this show and, uh, several other others like it on, um, you know, on, on our network, duckfeed.tv, uh, which has everything from, uh, a bad games show or a, a show about bad games, uh, up to this, which is a, a show where we talk about poops as they relate to deserts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> but um uh but but until next time uh long days and pleasant nights and twice as many to you yeah any questions before we go this book's about a pirate right Yes. <laughs> okay. Yep. The, it's it's the the blunderbuss swinger. <laughs>